كما جاء في محكم التنزيل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون Dear brothers and sisters, we begin with an abundant praise and gratitude. We are blessed with so many favors, countless blessings. We are soaking up the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every single day. It is from the beginning of waking up that we embrace this life of gratitude. And through our day, we're going to come up short. We will have the influence of evil around us. We will be tested. And so we seek His guidance, we seek His assistance in our affairs, and we seek His forgiveness when we fault. Guidance is the most precious gem that anyone should treat as the most important part of their life. And so anyone whom he guides, anyone who takes that path of the Qur'an and takes the path of our beloved Prophet wasallam, you can't find anyone to misguide that person. And when someone doesn't take that path, you will uh, find no guidance for that person until their heart changes and he is the one who knows what's in the hearts. Today I come reflecting upon the Qur'an's most significant verse 
and on many examples of the Prophet Sallallahu life regarding law. Regarding law. And so when we say law, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has blessed us. We have a divine law. We have an understanding of structure for our lives. But I believe that the majority of Muslims, and unfortunately way too many quote-unquote religious Muslims, understand law in terms of trying to find something wrong with people and events and things, and then hastening to judgment and condemnment, and then putting everybody against such a thing. This is an attitude that we must rectify within the Muslim community, because it is a sickness of the heart, and it is, ne it is totally neglecting so much foundational teaching from the Qur'an. So, God says very clearly in establishing the defining reality of <coughs> law, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِيْتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْهَى عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغْنِ يَعِظُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ Indeed, God is commanding and enjoining everyone to stand for justice, to stand for the truth of fair treatment for everyone. Then He goes a step above that. وَالْإِحْسَانِ don't just stop at justice and fair treatment. Be this selfless, compassionate, God-conscious, God-fearing person that is looking to take care of others' well-being and giving them the benefit of the doubt when there is room and looking for that room. And wa'ita idil qurba and to preserve the rights of those closest to you in your family and your neighbors. So in Islamic law, we see that there is this precedence of establishing a certain standard to preserve society from chaos and corruption. These are the foul and filthy immoralities of society. And these are the uh, infringements upon people's rights and upon divine law. And baghi is talking about aggression, transgression. Uh, offensive behavior. This is baghi, right? So he prohibits all of that. And he lovingly, يعيذكم, he lovingly preaches this message to you so that you will continually remember it. So let's take a look at the life of the Prophet ﷺ. I am becoming sure more and more about the problem and the solution all the time whenever I follow what's going on in the Muslim world and whenever I follow what's going on in our community here in America and I watch that most Muslims are not interested in being part of the Muslim community and they don't even really attend much and they are annoyed in many cases or they keep secret to themselves a sense of annoyance from religious people right and I know why that is it is a certain attitude that has to change it is an attitude you hear stories of countries that so-called are following Islamic law and they are supposedly Muslim states and they have applications of the law that are totally missing the Prophet Sallallahu example. So I'll give you one example. A woman comes to the Prophet Sallallahu in Medina and she said, I have fornicated, right? So the attitude that is prevalent in our ummah today, get the rocks, let's stone her. She has openly admitted it this is guilt beyond a shadow of a doubt. Let's get her. That is the mob mentality. That is the condemning judgmental attitude that is prevalent, not just amongst common religious or unreligious Muslims, as we will talk about in clear examples of the modern day in a moment, but in the courts of those who are supposedly trained in Islamic law to apply it. It's a total disgrace. And this feeds and fuels. They're saying, okay, you guys keep talking about in these interfaith circles all these beautiful verses and hadith. But when we look at the practical application in those countries that claim to have Islamic law, here's what we see. And the Muslims who live here say this, they, they live there say the same thing. That's why when they get on a plane to leave, they completely change who they are because they're glad to have freedom from this very harsh judgmental society that seems to not allow them to embrace Islam based upon an honest choosing of the religion, rather it is forced harshly upon them, right? And so the Prophet Sallallahu the woman comes up and she says, I have fornicated. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, 
Tubi ila Rabbik. Go repent to your Lord. That was an open ended statement. And he did not qualify it or conditionalize it. He said, Go repent to your Lord. She, if, according to the hadith, if she wanted to, it would have been completely within the Prophet's advice for her to go repent, change her life, and everything would have been okay, and Allah would have forgiven her, because that's what the Rasulullah said. You cannot accuse him of missing or forgetting to mention something about what she should do. He just simply said that. Now this lady has deep faith, and so she kept coming back because she has this conscience, and she wants to be absolved of her sin. So that's a, a separate point that is aside from the fact of the original attitude of the Prophet <laughs> The Prophet told us, those rightly guided caliphs, who could, now we talk about a caliphate and a caliph, so when the most prominent one that you can think of before is Omar, without a shadow of a doubt, almost 11 years, and he founded all of the institutionalization that was established and used so beneficial for the people. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that whenever he heard some people had been caught stealing, right? There's an ayah. It says, فَقَطَعُوا أَيْدِيَهُمَ نَكَالًا مِنَ اللَّهِ It's in the Quran Surah Al-Ma'idah. Umar hears. Now, the common attitude of today in the courts and in the attitude of some, so many Muslims is they stole, take the hand, right? But that's not what the whole Islamic law is, and that's not the spirit of the law, and that is not true justice. Omar understands those three things that I just mentioned, because he is a righteous, just caliph that is following the example of the Prophet ﷺ we just heard regarding the woman before, and he said, why are they stealing? And he asked, and he found out that because there is a famine, and because people are having trouble making any money, that these people were stealing simply because they needed to feed their family. That's the only reason. Their purpose for stealing is not to make a living out of cheating people out of property and then becoming wealthy. Just simply they're trying to stay afloat. They're trying to stay alive. Durura. There's a necessity here. And so they're willing to break the boundaries to stay alive. And they, they played with Omar. Not only did Omar let them go without taking their hand, he took care of those and openly told those judges who were about to take the hand, that this is our fault as the caliphate. We have to establish an economic system that people can flourish. Now where is that leadership today? You see where I'm coming from? We are struggling as an ummah from top to bottom and we have to totally renovate and reform ourselves and go back to the original teachings <coughs> to do as such. Another example is the man who came to the Prophet in Ramadan. He comes to the Prophet ﷺ, he's sitting with his companions. He said, Wallahi halakt. Right? I have, I'm destroyed. And the Prophet ﷺ said, relax, what's wrong? He said, yesterday in Ramadan, I slept with my wife. In Ramadan. And he's reason he's so sad. he knows that that was a grave sin. To intentionally break the fast because of his desires when he was told not to. So the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, relax. Do you have a slave that you can free as an expiation? He said, I don't have a slave. He said, he said, this is my problem. He said, can you fast two months in a row? And the Prophet said, can you fast two months in a row? And the man responded, I can't even do that. I know I'm not able to do that. Right? And he said, well, can you feed 60 poor people uh, to expiate this sin? He said, I don't have anything. So then somebody walked in from his family, and I think it's Anas bin Malik, he walks in with a a uh, bucket of dates. He said, here, take this bucket of dates and then go out and give it to some poor people. The man responded. This is an authentic hadith that nobody ever questioned its authenticity. The man responded. He said, I don't know of a poorer family than my own. And the Prophet looked at him and said, are you serious? He said, yeah, and the people know this guy. And he said, then feed it to your family. فَضَحِكَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى حَتَّى بَدَتْ نَوَاجِدُ Right? He laughed and joked with him and said, I understand your situation, go ahead and eat from these dates. Where is that leadership? Where is that religiosity? That noble prophetic example in the lives of Muslims today? It's time for a revival, my dear brothers and sisters. Most people will say, Oh, هَذَا kafara, هُوَ أَنْكَرَ اللَّهِ هُوَ خَالِفَ الدِّينِ بِأَرْكَانِهَا And all of this. No. 
this man is a person who feels guilty. He really, really didn't want to do it, and now he's so... And the Prophet ﷺ is easygoing. In such a grave sin, the Prophet ﷺ is very easygoing with him. And it even gets deeper. If you don't know the story, but okay, we heard that in Islam the apostate is killed and that's a case closed issue. It is not. There is no consensus in Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah that the ruling for someone who apostated is that they should be killed. There is no consensus. There is a heated debate back to the companions of the <coughs> Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I'll give you one of the reasons why they said that's not the case. Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh. Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh. Listen to his story. He was an educated Qurayshi who embraced Islam. And then when they made the migration, he used to write the revelation for the Prophet ﷺ because he was one of the few literate people amongst the Muslims. And so when he was writing the revelation, it happened on an occasion that he heard the Prophet ﷺ telling him the ayah and he completed it. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, MashaAllah, fa, fa, uh, fa, uh, Ahsanallah, uh, فَتَبَارَكَ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ Surah Al-Mu'mineen Surah Al-Mu'mineen This ayah, he completed it. He heard what was said in it, and then he completed it. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, MashaAllah, that's exactly how it was revealed. And then he said, wow. So this guy started to think to himself, maybe Allah is revealing something to me, right? And then, he goes, well, it seems funny, but that actually led him away from Islam because after that, he started to, whenever he's writing, throw in stuff. And the Prophet ﷺ came to know about this from the companions, and he said, yeah, it's coming to me. And then I was revealed. Right? So this guy is saying that the revelation is coming. He became an apostate and he escaped back to Mecca. Right? And he became an apostate. And it was well known. And he started to tell people that he's getting revelation just like Muhammad. And then some people challenged him and he said, or maybe Muhammad is just saying stuff and I'm just saying stuff. So this is clear-cut apostasy. There's no question about it. And he kept going on and on and on in Mecca. And he was with the disbelievers for some time. Then the Prophet ﷺ came with his companions. And there were 17 people because of their grave sin that there was a uh, subject to capital punishment. His name was on the list. Rahman ibn Affan, he came, he said, let's talk to him and see where he stands and see if he can see the light. Right? And so the Prophet ﷺ, what did he say? No. He did it, he's apostate, kill it. That is not Rasulullah Sallallahu That is not him, according to what we know from scripture. That is not our beloved Prophet Sallallahu He said, okay, bring him here. And they had a discussion, and the Prophet Sallallahu saw hope in him, and he gave him a chance, and then he ended up embracing Islam later. And he became a very devout Muslim, and he went and uh, put his life on the line for the well-being of the Muslims and the stability of the state. And that's how he passed away, on his own. This is the reality of the Prophet ﷺ. Merciful, compassionate, forgiving, easygoing. At Tufayl, a Dusi. He comes to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, You told me to go to my people and invite them to Islam. And I've been talking to them for years now. And they are harsh and rigid and disrespectful. They hate Islam and they say bad things about you. People say, Oh, they drew a picture about the Prophet, ﷺ, right? Oh, that means this and that and the other. We should flip out and act crazy and, and, and insane. And confirm for everybody on the TV what they think about us. Right? What did the Prophet ﷺ do? So he said, Udu alayhim ya Rasulullah. Up to fail, he said, look, I've spent many years. They are clearly rejecting. They do not believe. My tribe is evil. No good. He said, call Allah to destroy them. Right? And there has been a couple of cases. The majority of the cases, the Prophet ﷺ prays for people. There are a couple of cases in which he prayed against a very evil person and they died exactly as he prayed, right? So then the Prophet ﷺ raised his hands. Allahumma ahdi dosan wa tibihim. And everybody's looking at the Prophet. They're all concerned. Now those dos is done. They're, that tribe is over, right? There will be a prayer against them and then we'll have some sort of war against them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Allah, guide a dos and make them good believers. And guess what happened? They all became Muslim and they became great believers. Exactly as he prayed. This is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When they came to Mecca, 10,000, a huge army, 
And they're going to a place where the Muslims, ha ha this is the center of the anti-Islam, war on Islam movement, right? This is Mecca where everybody has tortured, abused, humiliated, and murdered, and plotted wars and attempts of assassination on the Prophet ﷺ's life. The Prophet ﷺ comes leading an army of 10,000. And one of the companions, when they came up, he said, Inna hadha al-yawm, yawm al-malhama. This is going to be the day that we will slaughter these people. <laughs> and then the Prophet Sallallahu interjected and said, La, inna hadha al-yawm, yawm al-marhama. This is the day in which I will show them mercy. They will see divine mercy. This is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So then when he comes into Mecca, he saw all of the people and they are scared for their lives because they know what they have done over the last 22 years. And so he said, مَا تَظُنُّونَ أَنِّي فَاعِلٌ بِكُمْ What do you all think I'm going to do with you? And they all were just really, Oh, son, noble man, son of the great noble people, good, inshaAllah, we pray that it's good. He said, اِذْهَبُوا فَأَنْتُمُ الطُّلَقَاءِ Go! Everybody is free and there is nothing to be worried about as you are. Right? Nothing from Surah Tawbah is revealed yet. They have freedom now. It was till after they kept breaking these treaties that the Prophet ﷺ offered them. So why am I bringing up all of these beautiful foundational examples of who the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ The only purpose he was sent was mercy and compassion. The only time he waged war against anybody when it was clear those people didn't want anything else but war and they were an aggressive enemy seeking to cause corruption and harm to people. That's the only reason why he ever caused and started a war. And that's the only reason why anybody ever should have a war. And everybody on planet Earth has agreed that that is a normal, noble cause to, call, to wage war on such people. There is nothing wrong with our religion and there is nothing evil. What's wrong with our people is Muslims who claim to be following Islam and do not know the religion or the Prophet Sallallahu they're claiming to declare his messengership in their shahada. There is a illah fi shahada for people. The first pillar of Islam. You got people praying all the time and they're having an issue with the first pillar before praying. You got to know who Rasulullah Sallallahu was so that you can properly <laughs> embody and give the example to the people around you. So the story that I wanted to come to appeal to you about today is a very, very disturbing video that I watched. There's this woman named Farkhunda, and I don't know if I'm saying, I don't know a Persian language. Her name is Farkhunda. And the whole story from beginning to end as we know it now goes like this. She's a woman who has had mental issues and because in the Eastern culture people just assume mental issues maybe mean you're possessed by demons or something, right? They don't see a difference between the two. And so she started learning lots of Qur'an and she's teaching Qur'an. And there's a local Imam who's doing something called Ta'weez which in and of itself is completely antithesis to Islam. To write ayahs down and to tell people put this on a necklace or in your pocket or under your bed and it will protect you from evil. This is totally an innovation, if not disbelief in shirk in itself. So she started warning the people about this, and then this guy told the people that she burnt the Qur'an. And then the people, he started telling them, yeah, this woman burnt the Qur'an. And so then these people, in the video, I watched a whole mob of like a hundred. And these are mob of bearded men. These are actually modernized kids, shaved face and stuff mostly. They all are beating the tar out of her with sticks, jump, I mean, jumped on top of her like this. Then they carried her beaten, almost dead body and they light it on fire. And then they threw it over the bridge and then everybody, everybody standing there. Police are standing there watching it. Muslims are still, other bearded men who should be, you know, because mashallah and following the sunnah of the Prophet It's not a matter of facial hair, brother. You need to step in and save your sister. They're standing there watching. Watching like evil, crazy maniacs. A whole mob, hundreds, all around this. Nobody is stopping this. Nobody sees the real jihad here. The proper application of true jihad here is to step in and save that woman. 
Everybody thinks, ah, she burned the Qur'an. Who knows for sure? Who saw her burn the Qur'an? This is the sickness I'm talking about. This is where we have to fix the problem. It happened here. I was explaining to some brothers about the fiqh disagreement about, you know, certain things. And I mentioned how, you know, personally, you know, whenever I wear a suit, I prefer to use the polyester tie. And the brother said, ah, it looked like a pretty shiny tie. We were, we're not sure. Maybe it's silk. Don't think like that, brother. Assume the best, particularly about someone who's dedicated their life to the religion. This is a sickness. This is a sickness. What did the Prophet ﷺ teach us? Long before the Magna Carta was written and the idea of habeas corpus was in the Western world, the Prophet ﷺ taught it. The first place where you see habeas corpus from the mouth of Rasulullah ﷺ. What is habeas corpus if for some reason you don't know? We should put that one on the uh, citizenship exam. It means that you're innocent until proven guilty. So the Prophet said, if somebody claims something against somebody, they better bring the evidence and the proof. And if they don't bring it, then that person swears I didn't do it, and then we can't do anything about it. That's between them and Allah, until the evidence is proven. The interior minister and the head police chief of the place said, there is no evidence existing of a burnt Qur'an that the woman burnt. Somebody can bring a Qur'an and say she burnt it. Even then, even then, is there such thing as vigilantism in Islam? No. They don't kill anyone except for with truth. And so our scholars, all four madhabs and the other madhabs that aren't famous, have all agreed in consensus that that is a few categories. Number one, somebody's trying to kill you, they're holding a weapon. You can defend yourself. If you accidentally kill them, you're innocent. And number two and number three have nothing to do with us. It's the state, the Muslim country and its legal system. If there is somebody who has killed somebody or dealing drugs and alcohol or something or raping or whatever, or adultery, those things have capital punishment and that's a state issue. And then the third is a military issue which is the state's decision that has to be made by the ruler of the state who's a Muslim. That's the only cases, that's the haq. That is the cases according to the consensus of Muslim scholars in which somebody may kill somebody. Other than that, everybody's doing it as a criminal because they're a vigilante heretic who is causing chaos and corruption. And the verses that talk about those that spread chaos and corruption, that there are very severe punishments for this. So Alhamdulillah, our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan have arrested 26 people, 11 police officers. Alhamdulillah. The corruption isn't that bad. At least somebody's holding somebody accountable. 26 people have been arrested. And we are all waiting because there's all these hashtags. We are Farkhunda. Justice for Farkhunda. Everybody should spread that on Facebook and on Twitter. And Alhamdulillah, they had thousands of people gathering. For now the fifth day, I think now. All in the streets. And MashaAllah. Some of them might say this is bid'ah or whatever, but it's a point to be made because oppressing women is a systematic reality and a distortion of Islam in Afghanistan. The whole country does it. By system. I saw, they got an imam. I don't know Persian, so I don't know. Wallahi, it's somebody translated on BBC. I don't know. The guy translated, I'm hoping it's a false translation. Some imam, they said, what mosque, he's the imam, and they asked him about it. He said, well, we should look for the proof. So he started off in the right direction. But if it is, then they're innocent. No, brother, who gave you the right to lead anything? What scholar did you learn from? What method did you follow? He said, if it comes out that she burnt the Qur'an, those people are innocent. He said, I don't know if he said that. That's what the translation said. I'm having a hard time believing that BBC is going to falsely translate when you can hear the Persian so that somebody can hear it and say and make some case against them. You see? It's, it's a problematic issue. And we have this all over the Muslim world, very ignorant, foolish people who memorize lots of Qur'an, grow a long beard, and act like a sheikh, and then people just take them for sheikh and follow whatever they say. This is a big problem. we got to fix it. The Prophet ﷺ said, going back to now, states that claim to have hudud. The Prophet ﷺ said in the authentic hadith Sahih Muslim, please everybody scoop forward, people are standing in the back here. He said, Idra'ul hududa mastata'tum. Wa in kana lahu makhrajun, fa khallu sabira. Fa inna al 
الإمام أن يخطئ بالعفو خير له أن يخطئ من أن يخطئ بالعقوبة. This حديث authentic حديث. It's a hadith that has been thrown to the wayside in the Islamic legal systems that supposedly exist today. It says the Prophet ﷺ told all of the companions and those who would be judges, make sure you look for any possible excuse to avert applying the penal code and the capital punishment on people because it's better if you find any excuse, any way to get them out of it, get them out of it. Because it's better for the Imam and the judge to make a mistake in giving mercy and forgiveness than to make a mistake giving false punishment. That is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. There is so much missing, so much missing. People can't wait to condemn and judge. They think they are all muluk yawm ad -deen. I think that's how many Muslims look at themselves. Everybody's the mufti and the shaykh al-islam and the one making the judgment and the ruling. We are al-rahimun yarhamuhumul rahman irhamu man fil ard yarhamukum man fil sama. The true people of mercy are those are the ones that will get the mercy of the most merciful. And that is the way of the Muslims because that is the way of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Be merciful to everyone and everything on the earth and the merciful will be merciful with you. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, illuminate our hearts with mercy, compassion. Give us sincerity. Give us genuine understanding of truth and application of it in our lives. Make us be people that look for excuses in a merciful, compassionate way for everyone that seems to be doing something wrong. Make us people who don't pass judgment on others before we look into our own faults and defects. Make us those that if we do pass a judgment, it is 100% injustice and 100% following the teachings of your Prophet <laughs> Ya Allah, unify our hearts. Make us a people who represent Islam and the light of your guidance as found in the Quran and the Sunnah. Revive that message amongst us. Make our children see the beauty of Islam and make us be those that show Islam by our actions and do not disgrace you and your beloved Prophet by our actions. Make us the people who stand up for justice wherever it is, for all people who deserve it. Make us the people of kindness and gentleness, forgiveness, loving and understanding. And Ya Allah, please remove the turmoil and corruption and evil and crookedness and backwardness from the Muslim world and make us a people who embrace reform and change when we know it's in our best interest. And we send your peace and blessing and mercy upon your messenger Muhammad